Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Animus Corporation, providing insulin delivery products for people living with diabetes and part of the One Touch family. And by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hey, it's Stacy. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Welcome to a bonus episode of Diabetes Connections. I'm not waiting for the regularly scheduled Tuesday show because there's a deadline looming for this one. My guest needs your help. If you're new to the show, welcome. This is a bit of a departure, and this episode sounds a bit different. We're going to jump into the interview pretty much right away, and I'm recording at a remote location, so I apologize if the audio is a bit iffy. But as always, Diabetes Connections is about educating and inspiring about type 1 diabetes. My guest today is Stephen Reichert. Like many in the diabetes community, I first heard about Stephen through his website and his project, Living Vertical, where he documents his climbing, outdoor adventures, and a lot more. He's a photographer and filmmaker who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at age 16. Stephen's latest project is called Banting's Ghost, named after one of the researchers who discovered insulin in 1923. Sir Frederick Banting sold his share of the patent for a dollar. And this project will be a way to document the people who are struggling with access and affording insulin. Stephen's looking for help for donations. You'll hear why he doesn't want to fund this by turning to the healthcare industry at all, but he can't do it without any funding. You can find out how to help on our website at diabetes-connections.com, and I'll be posting on social media. There's an account set up, but the deadline for the first phase is June 30th, which is why I'm pushing this episode out so quickly. If you're hearing this episode after June 30th, and there's a really good chance you are because that's just a couple of days away from this recording, please check out the links anyway to stay up to date with the project and find out how you may still be able to help. All right, here's my talk with Stephen Reichert. Stephen, I have been following your work for years. I love what you had done with Living Vertical. It's been fun following your story. I'm so glad to have a chance to talk to you. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. I'm really excited to meet your listeners and uh, discuss the projects we're working on here. Yeah, a lot to talk about. Let's just start, though, by getting to know you a little bit better, because there's so much going on. Did did climbing come first for you, or did type 1 diabetes come first for you? So that part of my story is a uh, th- those things actually kind of came together in my life. I was diagnosed when I was 16 years old. I was actually living in Alaska at the time. I was away from my family in a uh, boarding school scenario, and I wound up getting really sick. And I was in the hospital after several months of unknown, undiagnosed. Um, what we later found out was type one diabetes, and I was actually in the ICU and. Uh, it was pretty pretty grim for uh, about a week and a half or so there. And there's a couple of days that I completely don't remember at all where I was unconscious. Um, and in that time, once I came to and I, I felt so much better, um, once I actually had a diagnosis, it was so much of a relief just to know what was wrong with me because for months leading up to that, I didn't know what, what was going on. And the symptoms that I presented with weren't severe enough to indicate something grave. It just seemed like I just couldn't really get all the way better, you know, and I think that's a fairly common element of of diagnosis. But as I was in the hospital, they, they basically told me that my life was, as I had known it, was over and that I wouldn't be able to do um, anything with any sort of independence. And as a 16 year old, you know, that really did not sit well with me. And for whatever reason, I, instead of going the direction of saying, you know, kind of giving up on my diabetes management or the idea of, you know, rebelling by doing less, I wanted to rebel by doing more. (laughs) And I went the opposite direction and said, I'm going to show these, you know, I'm going to show these guys that I can, you know, the things that they say I have to do, the limitations and whatnot, I'm going to be so disciplined 
uh, that I'm going to find a way around this stuff. And, you know, that mindset, you know, really, really helped me a lot. And it pushed me to find ways to adapt a new diagnosis that I was still learning, uh, push that into an outdoor context uh, between hiking and climbing, which we had just started doing when I was in high school at the time as part of a PE unit, um, where I took something, it was all variable, it was all new. And so rather than sort of adapting my management to a quote unquote normal scenario, and then having to readapt it later down the road, I kind of jumped right into sports and outdoor activity. And that became my normal, that became my baseline. And a lot of it has to do with just a sort of idealistic, if not ignorant mindset that right after diagnosis that I could do anything, you know, <laughs> that I wanted to. <laughs> now, before you go any further, uh, mm. boarding school in Alaska, I have a mental picture of, and I know it's not right because we've been lucky enough to be in Alaska, so I know it's not really all like this. But I have this vision of, you know, you're on the ice and you're outdoors all the time and it's just this rough and tumble atmosphere. What was school like there? I mean, are you from Alaska? No, I'm not. I'm actually, I was born in upstate New York and, uh, you know, it's kind of a... Which is kind of like Alaska. I've lived there for, I lived there for a while. Sometimes it feels like it. That's, that's very true. I found the, the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York <laughs> yeah. or even Maine. It's very, very similar uh, aside from some of the temperature extremes. Yeah. But even that, like once you get to, uh, and I was diagnosed in the winter time, so it was dark m much of the day. Like the sun would come up barely at like 11 and we were pretty close to the Arctic Circle actually. It was in the interior of Alaska, um, near town called Delta Junction. And when the sun would come up, it would barely come up. It would just be hazy. And then it would be like from 10, 30, 11 a.m. And then it would kind of go back down around 2, 30, 3 in the afternoon. And then the rest of the time was dusk or dark. And that winter, it got down to 70 below. It was a very, very cold winter. But once you kind of, I always tell people you get below 20 below, it all really feels the same. It's just really, really cold. And it's just a question of how soon you feel that after you step outside. <laughs> but you, you know, you layer up and, um, it's a, it's a unique environment for sure to live in, um, because you are much more closely, impacted by by nature there's less of a buffer there where i think a lot of other areas that are more you know urban uh, there's a lot more ability to kind of insulate oneself from how close we are to nature and the consequences of uh, the natural world around us and do you mind if i ask though why boarding school in alaska um uh, yeah for sure it's a uh, uh the the story the short story is that you know my parents were in the midst of a relationship crisis my mom was living in georgia my dad was in alaska and i was sort of the sticky wicket um you know i was around in 8th grade at the time 8th ninth grade and uh, I was problematic in terms of my behavior, and I was not uh, making life easy for either of my parents because, um, you know, kids in, in those types of situations, I guess, you know, you're going to kind of split the difference and try to manipulate things to your advantage. And I was getting into trouble um, as a result with, um, you know, with friends and, and just misbehaving and doing stupid stuff like, you know, um, that was sort of a, a precursor as my parents saw it to, you know, perhaps more um, irresponsible criminal behavior down the road. And they saw an opportunity to send me away to, uh, which it sounds kind of grim to say, you know, send you away to a boarding school <laughs> to get straightened out. But I had the opportunity to go. Um, we had a friend that um, was involved in running a, a school in Alaska where they had a really strong forensics and debate program. And one of the things that I have always been good at to a fault has been speaking and and uh, and arguing on some level. So uh, they they kind of encouraged that and said, hey, you know what, like we want you to go here and you can be on this debate team and you can, you know, um, you know, kind of use this this gift that you have in a way that is less harmful and, and difficult and uh, at the same time. 
you know, I think that it was a wake up call for me at, uh, uh, 15 years old and 15 into 16 that year that I spent up there because it's very different when you go from being a, a misbehaving punk kid with your parents to kind of cushion your, your poor behavior and you go into a scenario where it's strangers that you have to deal with and you have to find a way to get along because you don't have a, a back door to escape out of your stuck there and so you have to make decisions that you're going to live with and and i started to learn about the the social impact of you know kind of how you react and relate to people and making good decisions uh before right around the same time that i was diagnosed and that same concept came to bear in terms of uh, physiology and exercise with the, the type 1 diabetes diagnosis. Wow, that's really interesting. It's just a different kind of story. Thanks for sharing more detail about that. So you're, oh, I'm, so, I'm happy to. <laughs> <laughs> so you're diagnosed at 16. You're, you rebel, as you said, in the way that I'll show you. Don't tell me what I can't do. And then you found, you know, this career eventually in taking uh, pictures. I mean, I, I don't know that that's really the right way to say it. You're a, a documentary adventure photographer, and you do many other things as well. But how did you get to there? That's a, that's a question I ask myself on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, I never really, I mean, from the time I was diagnosed, I just accepted the idea that diabetes was going to be what I do. That was my full-time job and anything else that came into my life would be secondary to that. So I realized shortly after diagnosis and, and discovering climbing, which, you know, like I said, went hand in hand for me, that being outside made a huge difference on my ability to be successful and to be healthy. And so when I graduated from college, which was I had a degree and have a degree in English and philosophy, um, you know, I studied based on the things that I was good at because I, I was not interested in stressing myself out to get a more lucrative um, degree. Uh, because I always felt like if I study and I pursue the things I'm interested in and good at, that somehow that will work out in my favor down the road, which, um, you know, is not always, as I think a lot of folks in my generation have, have been learning, that's not always accurate. But um, I found that I had to kind of cobble together a career because there wasn't really a opportunity to step into something that checked all the boxes where I was doing creative communications and spending a lot of time outdoors. And so most of what I did in my formative career phase was uh, running camps, um, lifeguarding. I taught swim lessons, ran aquatics programs, uh, ran some outdoor adventure camps. And then eventually, as I got further into climbing, I actually uh, started working as a climbing guide where I would, you know, take complete beginners from all over the country who would come to visit um, Zion National Park, which is the area where I was guiding mm, um, for a company out there. And, and I got to have so many really unique experiences with people where their lives were instantly changed by discovering that they could overcome challenges in the outdoors, that that kind of got me thinking. And this is 10 years at this point into my diagnosis where I still hadn't really fully settled on any sort of career. It got me to to think about the impact that the outdoors has had on my life and how that impacted my diabetes. And it was around 2011 that that all coalesced into my formation of Living Vertical, which is when I started really trying to combine the outdoors with creative pursuits of photography and documentary filmmaking and, and blogging. And I just kind of one day woke up and said, uh, you know, I'm going to give this a go. And, and my wife you know, encourages my some of my my crazy ideas. And, and that was what happened one day. We were just like, hey, you know, we wanted to do another climbing trip and we didn't really have any kind of solid career things going on. We were just, you know, paying off bills and then we would go on another trip once we paid down our debt and we would just kind of do six month cycles of, of doing that. So we were like, hey, why don't we try, you know, and we always did a little blogging and, and writing back when social media was in its infancy, but that was for our families and the idea of actually making any money off of that was a complete uh you know not even in the picture whatsoever but that was kind of how i got to the point of connecting um you know the creative pursuits the outdoors and diabetes how did you decide that you were going to do something 
on this very difficult and challenging topic of the price of insulin. I mean, there's so much to it. There's a lot of frustration and a lot of talking, especially on social media, but, but not a lot of people have stepped up to say, here's what we can do. Tell me about the project that I think you're calling Banting's Ghost. That is the working title, and uh, that title may change at some point in the future. But yes, the the general concept of this documentary project, which I've just posted some uh, a video that kind of gives a two and a half minute summary of this. It'll be uh, live on my Facebook page. I'm going to keep it pinned there, the Living Vertical Facebook page. Um, and the general idea is that I want to create a photojournalistic platform to share the stories of people that are knee deep in this struggle to afford their insulin because, um, you know, from a very general standpoint, I think that, as you mentioned, this is a very complex issue. There are many different players with a lot to gain and lose. And I think that there's a lot of disconnection between the different parts of the equation and what that translates into is a scenario where everybody is blaming and yelling um, like on social media and I, I engage in a little uh, constructive ranting from time to time because honestly it feels good you know it feels good to get stuff out there and be heard but the reality is that it's an understanding and a connection that is a little more passive and that isn't so blame oriented but that just puts the truth out there in an unfiltered way that i think has the opportunity to impact people at different uh, ends of this food chain for lack of a better uh, analogy uh, to to help people understand each other whether that is you know people at the on you know on the consumer side is people with type 1 people in the industry and my goal with this project is really just to tell the stories of people uh, all throughout the um, process of this insulin access crisis whether that be you know industry insiders that want to unburden themselves and want to tell a confidential story um, and people living with type one that are working three jobs and, you know, have to face getting kicked out of their home in order to, you know, so they're rationing their insulin. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of these kind of stories that don't get told on a consistent basis because, you know, eventually every now and then the New York Times or HuffPo or whatever, they'll pick up a story like this when it's especially eye catching. But I think what we miss is the daily grind that these people are living with um, on a consistent basis and the stories and not so much just to say, well, let's talk about how much it's awful and how it just grinds people down, because I think that certainly is part of the picture. But to explore what these people's lives are like and give people the chance to get to know them and really, you know, that's the beauty of documentary photography and filmmaking is that it allows you to really get to know people and get to feel something because when you read a sensational article or when you read a rant, it's just like, okay, this is frustrating. This is bad, but it doesn't give you a sense of who that person is and, you know, create that desire to maybe think differently about the way things are going. And I know that that's very idealistic to say that, you know, photojournalism on some level can help change things. But I, I've always been really inspired by things like Humans of New York. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I um, very plainly am, am happy to rip off that concept of connecting people through stories and through images. And, and my vision for this project is to execute it a little bit differently, not just have random people all the time. But Similarly, you know, you can't read Humans of New York and visit that page and just like read one story and click away because every time you read a story, you feel something different. You feel anger, you feel fear, you feel curiosity, you feel all of these different things. And when you're dealing with a technical medical condition and you're dealing with a complex technical problem within a technical medical condition, you hear a lot of technical in there and there's not a lot of human and I think that photojournalism gives us the opportunity to change that. Um, and that's kind of a long answer. And and I would like to answer kind of the second part of that sure. as well, which is why hasn't anybody done this? And I think there that answer, again, is multifaceted. But 
it's really hard because number one, photojournalism as a, as a thing is, is challenging and it takes time and money. Documentary work is expensive and time consuming because you have to find people, you have to build a relationship, you have to get to know them and then you have to follow them around and make something out of their story in a way that is uh, authentic and that doesn't get in their way and, and make their lives worse for your efforts on their behalf. And the truth is that um, doing that and getting support for that, most of the things that we see within the diabetes community that are driven from within the diabetes community, they have some element of they're, they're industry conscious on some level, because if you don't get a check from somebody in the industry, most time and labor intensive operations that you can't just do in your free time, they have to have funding and support from the industry. And there is a culture of professional advocacy within the diabetes community. And I don't say that in judgment. I say that in just simple matter of fact, like that's the way it is. Um, the people that are the leaders and the advocates within the community, they have a responsibility to their family and to their livelihood to maintain a friendly tone towards the industry because if they abandon that then nobody will touch them with a 10-foot pole and they're not able to you know do any good and i've been in that role uh, in the early years of of living vertical i had some industry partnerships that um not with the insulin industry as such, but I made a lot of friends within the industry. And I, I you know, want to be clear that the, the goal of this project isn't to demonize the industry. It's to tell stories of people who are on all different sides of this insulin access issue and get people to understand the impacts of what is going on and to feel some connection and feel some emotion rather than just looking at everything as numbers on a spreadsheet or a growing balance on a credit card. And, you know, I've been in that position where I have curbed the tone of the things that I say and the things I will talk about based on the fact that, well, if I kind of look like I'm going the route of Michael Moore and <laughs> I'm not industry friendly, how am I going to feed myself? You know, and I got to the point uh, several years ago where I guess I just wasn't good at industry sponsorship because I could never uh, I could never really close the deal and, and get consistent support from the industry and it's like it wasn't worth it for me to, to curb my tone anymore and I said you know I have the privilege of being a person who doesn't feel limited or worried about losing their audience losing their support because you know um, as a creative I do things like logging and I do contract work and I do, you know, even guiding still. I, that's how I support myself. Um, being a, a photographer and adventure photojournalist or what have you, it's not very lucrative. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, my hope is that with this project, I can use the low overhead that I have and the lack of responsibility to the industry to tackle a difficult issue. It's well said. And I and, you know, listen, as you listen to this podcast, um, you know, I am sponsored by right now Animus and Dexcom. And I definitely hear what you're saying. It's a very interesting line. What about the audience for this? Who is going to look at this and feel like it needs to change? Because most people with type one diabetes already feel like the price of insulin is out of control but the question is what to do about it. Are you trying to, you know, uh, are you trying to make this for people like me who have family members with type one, people who are, you know, in a position to make a change in the industry or in Congress? Who's the audience ultimately? So yes, is the answer to your, your question. <laughs> um, I think that you're right on the money when you say that, you know, the diabetes community already is frustrated and aware of this. And one of the things is you have individuals who are advocates, um, not professional advocates, but advocates for, you know, changing like the insulin for all hashtag and, and uh, T1 International and some other um, nonprofit organizations and, and associated individuals have, have really been leading this charge, at least to what I can see. And one of the challenges is those organizations, again, because of their 
stance of standing up to the industry, their funding is non-existent or very, um, very much their opportunities for funding are, are very limited because they have willfully cut out the attachment to the industry, which is a very bold choice for them to make. But it also makes it harder for them to create the media that is sticky and that makes issues um, rocket into the public eye and the public awareness. And so some of my hope for this project is for it to reach the public because we already know what the problem is and, and the diabetes community doesn't need these stories, although I do think that there is a benefit to – you know, the people that get to be professional advocates, whether they're paid to do so or whether they have support from a spouse or an independent source that allows them the time to be active and to discuss their reality with diabetes, that's a huge privilege that there's a, a class of people with diabetes that don't have that privilege on almost any level. And what I would like to do is use this project as a platform for them to be able to really share their perspective um, in a way that, you know, doesn't necessarily fix the problem that their class within the diabetes community is still problematic, but obviously can bring some attention to that and, and use the platform that I have for their benefit. Um, in terms of the audience, though, I, I think that it is a multifaceted thing and to me, when I look at this, I think that um, a lot of it comes down to leverage and applying pressure where it's needed, but doing it in an appropriate way. And I think that ultimately what is going to potentially turn the tide on this is when you have the large community organizations um, like the JDRF and the ADA that embrace the role of holding the industry accountable. And I think part of that it, for them and these organizations, it's an awareness that they can do that without crippling their organization and crippling their bottom line. And I think that on some level, um, you know, as businesses, they have to be thoughtful about what they do and how they do it because they have employees and goals and missions that they rely on the industry for that support. And I think that a, um, you know, the role of these community organizations is to serve the community. And right now, the community, I believe more than anything else, needs access to insulin. Because what good are advancements if people don't have access to them? And, and somehow we have this idea that uh, if we just get enough advancements, that somehow that is going to break down into more people having access to those advancements. And right now we have people that are dying and having a measurably worse quality of life because they can't get access to things that were developed 20 years ago. And again, I think it's sort of an ivory tower type of thing where the people who really need to be heard and their perspective needs to be understood. It's the people that aren't represented at the, you know, the fundraising galas, the people who don't have two cents to put towards the JDRF, uh, you know, the fundraising and the research. It's the people who are in the trenches who don't even bother interacting or engaging with these larger organizations because they just don't see themselves represented. They don't see any benefit there. But I believe that is more than half of the diabetes population, the type one population in the United States is people who just don't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times there's this idea that the people who are vocal about type one, the advocates and the people on Twitter and whatnot, that that is representative of people with diabetes. And I contend that the vast majority of people with diabetes are jaded. They feel neglected. They're struggling and they're not represented by the actions that are happening on a larger scale within a lot of the larger organizations that um, I think ultimately need to make access to insulin the number one priority on a consistent basis until it changes rather than – and I know that there have been been some efforts, you know, petitions here and there, and I think that that's a good start. But I think there's a big difference between um, PR moves to try to, you know, kind of get – 
the community, the vocal people in the community off uh, off their back and say, oh, we're doing something versus saying, you know what, we're going to actually make this our priority until change happens. And it's all about leverage. It's all about pushing because the constituents and the people that support these organizations, I believe that when they consistently deliver that same message that, look, we want you to do this. This is the issue that we want you to prioritize, that those organizations will be able to do that effectively without shutting their doors and without, you know, committing business suicide. They can do that if there's a consolidated message. And and this is only one of the possible outcomes. And I know I kind of went off on a tangent, but <laughs> it's just trying to connect. It's trying to connect people because it's so all the advocacy efforts around access to insulin, it's so disjointed. And there really isn't any visible point, whether it's individuals or organizations that are highly visible, like a Nick Jonas type of person or a JDRF type of organization that are saying, all we're going to do until this issue changes is we're going to hammer on this until there is a change. Everybody with visibility, they it's a stop that they make along the circuit, but it's not consistent. And so my hope is creating consistent media allows there to be a central reference point that advocates and others who couldn't afford to make this stuff on their own can use that in their own efforts to make noise and and rock the boat until we get some change because you know um and, and this is this is another just brief aside um social media is not the area that pharmaceutical companies deal in the pharmaceutical industry has been way behind in social media because of all the regulatory things and so when you just do stuff you know the leverage that people apply on social media and the negative tweets that's not going to do anything the only way to affect change is to go to the areas where the pharmaceutical industry is very well established and get that conversation happening there and that is when it comes to policy and government and lobbying and there are a handful of organizations which i have referenced in this last little tirade that have the ability to apply pressure there where it counts and so i think it's a it's a chain reaction and again multifaceted, cathartic for some people who find themselves, you know, without a voice and hopefully something that will, um, you know, spur a chain reaction that applies pressure to the larger community organizations to apply pressure through lobbying and on a consistent basis with primary loyalty to the community rather than protecting industry relationships first. And I know that's a, that's a lot to ask. Um, that's a lot, that's a tall order, but that's one of the outcomes, the main outcome I think that I would really like to see is, um, consistent pressure applied until people start talking to each other. You know, it's not like the industry can just magically fix everything or the insurance companies can magically fix everything, but we need to stop blaming and just say, look, this is a priority and we're not going to leave this alone until it changes. So it's like shutting the two kids in the room and say, look, nobody's coming down to have dinner <laughs> until you guys start talking to each other and make things right. Because people are dying and people are suffering and struggling and all this bad stuff because everybody just wants to pass the buck and, and worry about the PR and say, well, as long as we you know just lip service here and pass the buck, then, then it's all good. And it's not. And I think being reminded of the people that are impacted, I think that's where that's where we can start this process. Where are you going to find the people? Because I'm sure a lot of people listening are thinking, uh, yeah, hell yeah, I want to be in this. How, you know, how are you finding people and, and, and making this you know, work so that you're not traveling all over the country? Well, finding and funding are two things that I'm doing just very organically. And, you know, part of what I'm asking for people to do if they visit my website, livingvertical.org, or if you visit any of our social media channels, I'm at Living Vertical on every known manifestation of social media. <laughs> um, you know, you will be able to find information about um, what we're doing and, and you can reach out and contact me whether you would like to support it. I have a Patreon campaign that is, uh, that is ongoing. And 
basically what I'm trying to do is roll out the funding in stages and say, okay, with $250 a month, I can start, you know, researching and getting things ready and planned and getting the groundwork laid. Once I hit $500 a month, I can start traveling because traveling is something I enjoy doing and I'm willing to do on the cheap because I don't think there's a way to do this um, from an artistic standpoint the way that I want to without going places. Yeah. And meeting people where they are and word of mouth travels, um, you know, and people know people. And and one of the things I think that I've had the, the privilege of connecting with a lot of people who are outsiders within the air quotes diabetes online community, people who are not in the uh, in the know or who are not known personalities within the diabetes online community, but people who as I mentioned earlier, who are just feel disenfranchised and would never otherwise connect because I've always come at diabetes from like, oh, I climb and I do stuff. P.S. I have diabetes rather than be like diabetes, diabetes, diabetes. That just hasn't been my, you know, and, and I think that m my approach has worked for people who have not found a foothold elsewhere. And so I, I have an idea of some some individuals where I want to start. Um, but I absolutely encourage people to reach out and contact me if they have stories, if they know people, um, you know, people who are in the industry. Again, this is not an industry hit piece that I'm that I'm working on. It's about starting difficult conversations, admittedly, and I can't offer shelter to the industry when people are going to express their perspectives on it. Um, but at the same time, I would love to hear from people within the industry who are struggling with this issue on their own level. And, uh, you know, my hope is that I can, I can, you know, even healthcare providers and, and everybody like it's a complex problem. It's going to take a complex conversation to reach a complex solution. Um, so grassroots is, is really the answer to, to everything at this point, because this is a, it's a risky endeavor in, in a lot of ways. Like, I don't know if this is going to work. It very it might completely fall flat, and after a month, it just might be a smoking crater in the internet <laughs> that is a warning to other creators and say, "Hey, if you want to make a living and you want to, you know, keep an audience and have funding to do what you do that does good for the world, don't try to do something like this because it's a terrible idea." And people, you know, it's hard to fund things from within the, the community on a grassroots level because I know that. The diabetes community is a group of people who are already immensely burdened. Exactly. So it might not work, and that's okay, but I, I want to try. It's something I've always wanted to do, and I don't think I've ever been in a better position to say, hey, you know what? I, I'm going to do it. It needs to be said, you know? Yeah. Well, before I, I let you go, um, we started talking about, you know, your outdoor stuff and you and your wife, six months working, six months on the road. It's got a little bit more complicated, right? Um, didn't you have a baby not too long ago? Three years ago, wow. yes, just wow. just three years. Yep, uh, time flies. Yeah, how's she doing? Oh, she's doing great. She's a she's a peach. You know, we just started fishing together, and uh, she caught her first fish last weekend, and I'm <laughs> super proud. You know, I uh, and that's part of the reason. You know, when I started living vertical, I didn't have her in the picture, as you right. say, and so I was able to do a lot more things on a shoestring. And the point that I'm at now, having done some shoestring projects where I spent my own money and went in the hole financially because I wanted to tell a certain story, that's not a freedom that I currently have. And I'm sure that you and a lot of your listeners are probably parents and they understand that too. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the pragmatic component of this project comes in that like I have a skill that I can offer, but I can't do it without support. You know, this is something that it has to be you know, not only financially, although that's certainly part of it, but also in terms of sharing the the work and sharing the funding effort and also, you know, finding the stories and getting people who are willing to take their own risk by, you know, telling their story and, and all of that. So it's complicated. Yeah, it absolutely is. But there is something about the visual medium, as you say. I always said, you know, working in TV news and then in radio, it seems as though to me – Audio is is very and I'm tapping my headphones. Sorry about that. Audio no is is very you know it's very informative and it's very intimate, but mm -hmm. but television and visual is so emotional. 
there, there's just something you can convey with a, a few seconds of video that you would find a very hard time to get across in a newspaper or in, mm. you know, in a podcast or on a radio show. And I, I really, I, I'm excited to follow what you're doing because I do think that these personal stories, that's the reason, right, why people go and testify in front of Congress. That's why people show up instead of calling. Because when you're looking mm -hmm. at somebody, it's much more difficult to dismiss it. And so I yes. really applaud you for this. I think it's going to be very interesting to follow. And I, and I definitely hope that we help spread the word about it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that immensely. And just so your listeners are clear, um, you know, my goal when, when you hear documentary project, a lot of times people think, oh, you're going to make Food Incorporated and it's going to be on Netflix. <laughs> um, you know, the way people consume media has changed so much that my goal is to create a barrage of all different ty types of multimedia through a variety of different platforms. That's the ultimate manifestation. And, and what I'm doing is I'm starting this. And if people visit my Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash living vertical, sorry to just kind of throw that out no, there. No, that's great. We'll, link plug. It all up. we'll link it all up. Thank you. Um, there's a breakdown there of what my funding goals are, at least what I can see of those goals to say, this is how much I need to start. And as I start, the first manifestation of this project is going to be photo stories like humans of New York style, because that is the most efficient and allows me to do this as a part time project um, while still, you know, looking for contract work and doing logging and participating in medical trials if need be, you know, and doing various things to pay the bills. Um, but so that I still have something I can do to get the project started. And, and as I'm shooting, you know, shooting video isn't the hard part. It's editing and kind of doing that that's more time and labor intensive. And my hope is that, you know, by starting the project w as a photo project, it will grow into, you know, the support for it will grow to where we can start doing video and eventually audio as well. And, of course, blog posting as part of that so that we have different stories in different mediums so that different people who consume media very differently, everybody has access to some way to connect to this to create that impact that, that you mentioned because audio has its own things that are really awesome. That intimacy video has its own, own benefits, still photos. And, um, I want to do it all, but I'm very, very conscious of the fact that, um, I have to do it incrementally in stages so that I can do each stage excellently which will help grow the project to the next stage so that I can, you know, not bite off more than I can chew. Cause I've definitely, I've done, I've bit off more than I can chew, bitten off more than I could chew in the past. And, uh, <laughs> it's not a <laughs> recipe for success. <laughs> well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. We will link everything up at diabetes connections.com. And I look forward to checking in with you as you move forward. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the time and, and your listeners' time to, uh, you know, give feedback on this idea. And, you know, you can find me linked in the, in the show notes for social media and my website and all that. I would love, love to hear from you. You can email me at my website as, as well. Um, you know, and, and this project is going to be done respectfully and confidentially in, in, you know, when people request that. So I want to create this as a, uh, I mean, the, the term safe space is kind of loaded because I don't think such a thing exists in nature or in reality, but I, I want to, um, offer my, my services in a respectful way for people to be able to get their story out in a way that is most, uh, amenable to everybody. If you'd like to help, all the information is at diabetes-connections.com. I'll be posting links on social media as well. This project, again, it, you know, he needs the uh, funding by the deadline of June 30th. That is his first deadline to see if this project is going to be a go. And that's just a couple of days away from this recording. So if you want to help, I urge you, please don't wait. Make a contribution if you're so moved, but you got to do it quickly. And if you're hearing the episode after June 30th, please take a moment to check out the links anyway and see where Stephen is with the project. There are going to be ways to help as he moves forward. And I'll update the site regularly. So if by chance he can't move forward at this point, um, if he revisits it, I'll circle back around and make sure that the information linked to the show is always accurate so that you can help at any stage of this one. I think this is really important because as I said, you know, there's something about pictures. There's something about seeing 
that is different. You know, audio, as you listen to the podcast, it's so intimate. Um, and it's it's different, right? It's not quite as emotional. There, there's more emotion here than reading something. You get more of the flavor of people's personality. But there's something about looking at the faces and and hearing the voices at the same time that is much more emotional and impactful. So I really applaud Stephen for working on this project, and I hope it comes through. Well, thanks for listening to a, a bonus episode of Diabetes Connections. I will be back next week on July 4th as we travel to the Friends for Life conference in Orlando. A lot of fun stuff there, I am sure, to tell you all about. I'm excited to bring you the stories from that terrific conference. So in the meantime, thanks again for listening. I hope if you can help Stephen, if you're moved to help, that you can also move quickly and give him a hand. I'm Stacey Sims, and I'll see you back here on Tuesday. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.